Hello, my name is John Morgan. I am director of the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics here at Stony Brook University. And we are at the Simon Center today. We have Rob Kirby, Nigel Hitchin, who will be interviewing Sir Michael Atia about his life in mathematics and more generally his life. Gentlemen. Okay, well, uh, Michael, we're here in the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics. Do you think it's a golden age for the two subjects, or was that long ago in Newton's time? <laughs> um, it's very difficult to recognize a golden age when you're inside it, actually. You, when you get a bit of perspective, it helps. But um, I think it's been going sufficiently active for some time that we, we, we are living through something of a golden age. How big an age it will appear you know, a century later on remains to be seen. But right at the moment, it looks an active uh, subject area and that's why this centre has been built and I think correctly it's a, it's a focal point for a very exciting activity at the right at this moment but posterity may have different views. <laughs> so mathematicians are, are used to viewing all sorts of objects as spaces which means like importing the geometrical viewpoint to different areas of mathematics. Yeah. So you think the main import from physics is uh, a language or a set of metaphors for us to look at our own subject or is it more than that? I think it's more than that. Uh, you know, the notion of space is, <coughs> fun and sometimes fundamentally, the, where we live and move and has been for thousands of years. It has diff gone through different eras with the Greeks and the more modern ideas of physicists, and it evolves. It, it doesn't always mean the same thing. It increases dimension by give one or two more here and there. It can change its shape by curving. So I think space is, is but it's part of our. Um, visual imagination and then we use it to a great extent because our brains are very well attuned to seeing things and thinking in terms of three dimensions. So I think it, it permeates mathematics and physics and <coughs> it embodies the central parts of, of, of a lot of physics. So I think it's more than just a, a, a notation or a symbolism. There's something rather deep about it. But then do you think physicists have a, a different vision that, that we can uh, benefit from as pure mathematicians? Oh yes, no question. No, I, I mix a lot with physicists over the last decades. Physicists have a lot of intuition coming from the results of uh, their training, experimental data, what happens in the physical world. I've had physicists explain to me you know, how some complicated phenomenon happens. You put a magnet here and it floats around in space. And so no, they, they, they have a lot of wealth of um, um, intuition based on concrete experience, based on real physical world, uh, which they've honed and tuned and developed, a lot of it is mathematical, but a lot of it is in intuitive. And that mathematicians don't generally have. So part of this interaction is to, uh, to learn from the physicists. I don't mean learn in a formal way. You learn by osmosis, by talking to people and absorbing their instincts. And I think that's sort of been going on now for some, some decades. And a lot of mathematicians have become a bit more educated, let's say, about the way physicists think and aren't quite as critical. Uh, the physicists tend to think in much more intuitive non-rigorous terms, which doesn't mean it's not precise in any way. Mathematicians have learned to accommodate that so they can communicate. Do you think it's, it's possible for, or is it desirable for us mathematicians to go through the whole process of learning quantum theory the way that a physicist would as a, as a graduate student? Or is, it, is that counterproductive? <coughs> well, um, for older mathematicians like me and even like you, uh, it's a bit late. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you train, what you're training when you're young sticks with you for life and makes helps to make your background. Later on, you can learn a few bits here and there. You can imp widen your knowledge. You can't really re-educate yourself from the ground up. Uh, with the younger generation, it's a bit different. They have a choice at what stage they want to become, learn their physics, their mathematics, and you you may get a new generation of your hybrids who are really half mathematicians and half physicists in some deep sense. Uh, but in general, I think it's useful to have different points of view. A mathematician has a point of view based on his intuition, his experience, which you know, uses the wide range of things in mathematics on which are outside physics. And so that's a complement to what the physicists bring. And I don't think it would be a good idea for all mathematicians to clone themselves on physicists, go into the lab, put on their lab coats, you know, get their hands dirty with what. That's where you just turn out second class physicists. Would I, think, I think it's important that they keep their own. Would, Thank you. would you say it's easier for physicists to morph into mathematicians to move in that direction than vice versa? Um, in some sense, yes. It depends, of course, which physicist you're talking about. If you're talking about the kind of physicist you meet in the mathematics corridor, yes. <laughs> He's moved a long way already. 
if you look at physicists you know, out in the, in the world, practical physicists who deals with wires and what used to be called valves, no, because they've got a long way to go. But the younger generation of physicists who become very theoretical and much fundamental physics is not extremely mathematical, automatic, they have to know mathematics. To, to master their own trade. And so it's a small step for many of them to go over and learn a bit more about new mathematics. And they learn it much better if they know its relevance to their field. Learning it in abstract, saying I'm going to learn a book on abstract algebra without motivation is very difficult. Learning about new subject with tell somebody tells you is highly relevant to what you're doing is much simpler. You, you can relate, you connect up. So, uh, but I think amongst the sort of people on the frontier, it's probably easier for the physicists <coughs> to pick up mathematics. Because mathematics is a physics is a much more vague a notion. You know, how do you pick up intuition how do you, without having gone through it all? How do you learn you know, to get a feel for the things? That, that is more difficult, I think. So I think you're right. It's easier one way than the other. Yeah. What about geometry and physics in your own mathematical life? Where, when did that begin? Well, you know, when I was a student, because um, I was a student in Cambridge, and in those days you learned Half the course was about pure mathematics, and half it was applied, applied mathematics, including some theory of physics, Maxwell's equations. So I got a basic training, but I, and I went to lectures by famous people like Dirac. But I was going to be a pure mathematician. Some of my friends drifted off, became theoretical physicists. I became a mathematician. We met again later, not many years later on. And at that stage, I wasn't really very interested in physics. I, 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 I dabbled with it a bit. I had, and then later on, I got interested in some aspects which I realized had a connection with physics. But I was not really much involved in physics until, well, until I turned 40. I don't know exactly, but I mean, it was. Uh, and then things started to happen, which were brought the physics much closer into the mathematics, and then I got more seriously involved. So that's probably been going for about 30 years. But in the first part of my life, I was definitely felt like a pure mathematician with a mild interest in physics. I would talk to these a little bit, but not, not seriously. Did this, did this changeover occur about the same time that? Uh, we discovered the physicists were were actually dealing with uh, vector bundles and connections, and in their own language with Christoffel symbols. And you know, say around 1972 or three, is yeah, it, it was a very de definite period. Uh, and and I remember it, it was sometime in the uh, early 70s, I think. And I remember going over to, to MIT to visit some of the physicists there, and when we discovered that what we mathematicians were doing was very similar almost identical in technical terms to what the physicists were doing it was under, for totally different motivation, with totally different um, description and totally different proof. So, and then we suddenly realized that we were talking about the same thing from different angles, and there were people around who said, well, yes, you should know this. because." And so a very, very short period of time, the dictionary started to evolve. Uh, people explained the terminology. And, you know, that's fun. But it meant even at the earlier stage when we, sort of, we, we, we realized they were doing the same thing, we had no idea where it, came from in physics and what, it, what the foundations were. We met at the top, top of the building instead of the bottom of the building. Later on, we had to go down and learn what was in the lower floors. But it was, it was meeting right on the, on the very frontier of the subject. And that's one of the interesting things that happened. In the past, mathematics and physics have interacted, but usually the mathematicians have interacted with physicists. Well, the mathematician comes along after the physicist has got all the interesting results and says, I'll clean this all up. I'll give you some rigorous proofs. And the physicists are no longer interested. They're, they're sort of on to the next challenge. In this case, it, uh, it happened differently. They, they met on the common frontier. What their physicists were doing and what mathematicians were doing were both at the frontier of their subject and the advanced stages. So there was really excitement on both sides. The physicists didn't just go away, we know all this. Uh, you know, they were, they were ex the same level as us. And that actually was a different experience from earlier times when the physicists were usually ignored the mathematicians. They'd say, you guys, all you do is come and lay the foundations after we've built the skyscraper. So, mm -hmm. uh, yes, it was a different, different uh, phenomenon then. What about the geometry, uh, going back further? Were you always interested in geometry, or did that develop? I was always interested in geometry, I think. You know, it depends on your definition of geometry. You know, people like Plato and say God was a geometer. I mean, to me, geometry encompasses most things in mathematics. As you get broader, you simply bring it all in in your empire. So, uh, but I was always a geometer, I think. I mean, when I was at school, my last year's school, I was very enthusiastic about projective geometry, good old-fashioned projective geometry, which is a beautiful subject, and uh, which is, became out of fashion very soon. Shortly after I went through the school, people said, oh, there's much too much geometry is taught in schools. Throw out Euclid. Uh, do them, give them algebra or computer science. So it, it, but I was old-fashioned geometer. I loved geometry. 
And then I went to university, we had to learn other things, but the next stage when I got a chance to learn the geometry at the next level, I, I took it up, differential geometry. So I was always, I think, a geometer in that sense. I, I enjoyed geometrical things. I liked, but, but under a very different heading. They could, they could be part of analysis, they could be part of algebra. Um, but I, I always enjoyed, and I think the, that's a matter of partly personality and temperament. I like to sort of see things. I mean, it's not literally, of course. What you see is a mathematical uh, symbol or uh, imagine, imagination attached to some ob mathematical object, putting it in pictorial or quasi-pictorial terms. So it's way, but I, I, as I said before, I think the, the, the visual um, skills of the brain are enormous. We can see, uh, and if I look around, I can absorb a vast amount of information in a fraction of a second, and I know what it means. And that's because the brain has been tuned over evolutionary history to do that, be very good at it. And, and whereas uh, things involving in computation on a piece of paper or algebraic and manipulation, weren't it, we didn't evolve to do that. You know, there was no evolution advantage you know, if you beat a, beat a monkey at writing out a formula. So it, 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 therefore, our brains still think, in a fundamental sense, visually. And if we can use that to help our mathematics, it, it's a very great advantage and it's a mistake to say that you know, geometry only deals with certain things and the rest of it is symbolism. You've got it the other way around. You've got to try to take anything you've got and put it into pictorial form so you can get some imagination way of thinking of it. In that, in that sense, I'm a broad-minded geometer. Yeah. Topology was a, a rapidly developing subject in the 50s and the 60s, yes. but you started more of a, as being an algebraic geometer, I suppose, coming from the classical side. So I, I saw that as a clear... Yeah. I started as a classical algebraic geometer, but I, I, I worked with my teachers, uh, Hodge and Todd, both of whom were on the sort of modern fringe of geometry. They'd both been involved with things which subsequently we recognize as topological, topological aspects of algebraic geometry, Hodge theory. So uh, I was on the sort of, uh, in good position from that point of view. I came from a classical background, but moving towards the new frontiers, and there was a lot of topology around at the time when I was there in Oxford and elsewhere, where new topological ideas, and, and when I went to Bonn with Hilsenbrook, a lot of new, new developments, which were in the frontier zone between algebraic. Uh, algebraic geometry played a big role in the early development of some aspects of topology. All the stuff that happened under, in Bonn and Arbeitstagen, uh, all about characteristic classes and numbers and forms. That all, that all was most large parts of it were motivated by algebraic geometry. So I, I had the right background for that. And uh, I got no. I didn't. I wasn't trained as a topologist in the sense that a lot of t other topologists at the time were in formulas and homotopy theory. But I, I came with a very good uh, view of how topology relates to, to algebraic geometry, and that's still a very important part of his role. Was was your uh, first work in, al in real algebraic topology? Was it K theory, and and why that particular subject? Well, <coughs> if that was <coughs> first. Um, it's difficult to remember. I mean, basically, K theory came out of algebraic geometry. Grotendieck's ideas, okay. this was algebraic geometry through chief cohomology and so on, and Grotendieck came along. He introduced K theory. I picked it up and put it back into topology because I was interested in the interface. I saw that it could be useful, combining that with topological ideas. So it was very natural for me to latch on to K theory that came out. Uh, I, I obviously had, may, I may even have written some minor papers on topological aspects a bit before, but uh, in a minor sort of way. But K-theory was the natural um, frontier zone between uh, algebraic geometry and topology in that period, centering around Grotendieck and Hitzbrook. And I was one of the first people to be, you know, fortunately invited to take part in these early meetings <coughs> when all the ideas were being thrashed out. So uh, it, and, you know, that, that launched me in the right direction. I was fortunate to be the right chap at the right time, you know, as you things go. Mm -hmm. Now, the, one of your major achievements was the index theorem, uh, which also took you from geometry and uh, topology into analysis. Uh, so how did that begin? <coughs> well, again, it's, it, it was a sort of continuous movement because it's not quite right to say it, the algebraic geometry had always had the aspect of complex analysis in it, going back to Riemann and in the great expansion. Uh, after the wars of chief cohomology by Serre and Cartier, that was formalized in a big way. Complex variable theory was... was so that branch of analysis, complex variable theory, 
was part of the tradition of algebraic geometry, and I learned it, and I learned the new stuff. So I knew all about uh, the D-bar operator and all that. Um, what the new bit was having to sort of move from that to real differential geometry, where you didn't have any complex structure, and you had to write down differential equations, but via the Laplace operator, that's not that far away. Um, you had to make a, there were two or three key steps that had to be reached, one of which you had to get away from the idea that you had chief cohomology groups in every dimension, and you had to focus on the difference between the odd and the even ones, and have a single operator that does that, which was the famous Dirac operator. And you know, once we realized that, then we, we got involved with real analysis, but it was kind of real analysis so close to complex analysis, it wasn't a totally different field. And uh, you, know, you had to learn a little bit of new terminology, and, but uh, it's really quite old. Um, analysis, um, potential theory, elliptic equations. Um, so these were, uh, interestingly enough, the big, the big barriers to progress or to make were not technical things, uh, were not how did you get into analysis from algebra. Or they were the conceptual thing. You know, why did you think of going into different field of What made you think that this was a productive thing to do? Those were the, and that was actually much takes much longer for that to happen. Learning the technique is the is comparatively easy part. A lot of textbooks are experts, um, but knowing what question to ask and why you should be thinking this way that that's actually uh, there's no rules for that. You just have to uh, pick it up and make good guesses and say be at the right place at the right time, have a bit of inspiration. Very uh, unpredictable pattern. Uh, so things don't work in the way that you know, subsequently people look back and say, oh, this was the obvious sequence of events. Yes, but the obvious things, the, d the bits that look obvious now, were well, the bits that were hard at the time, and vice versa. How did the, the big question arise between you and Singer, say? I mean, did you have an idea <coughs> about what the format of the theorem should be, and <coughs> when did Singer come in, become involved in it? Did he start it? What, what, well, what was the story? first of all, a caveat. It meant one's memory is always selective. <laughs> you remember what you did, and you tend to forget what the other guy did. <laughs> and I'm no exception to that. Uh, so it, 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 your Freud was very, very good on these sort of things. You suppress uh, the things that other people did, and you highlight your own contributions. But the, the um, um, let's see. The, the point was that <coughs> uh, we we started off with algebraic geometry. We had this famous Hilbert book Riemann Rock theorem, which is the culmination of a century of mathematics. Beautiful theorem, fantastic result, greatly general. And then K theory came along, good and and pushed it even further. This was tremendous stuff, and we all knew it. Um, and the, 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 what motivated me was a small, what appeared like a small sideline. Amongst all these formulas that Hilbert generated, there were the famous formulas that calculated the dimensions of spaces of solutions, of chief cohomology groups in terms of topological invariance. But then he manipulated the topological invariance with a great deal of formal skill. And so, some number of time you, you work out a formula. Where the answer, which appears to, on the face of it, be a rational number because it has denominators, is actually integer because you can express it as the dimension of a certain vector space. But sometimes it comes out to be integer without a vector space. You don't know where it comes from. So that intrigued me. And so we were trying to identify what some of these missing integers were that was predicted by the formulae. And we knew a lot of we had a lot of clues. We knew it had something to do with spinners. We knew the formulas for representation theory. Um, and we knew the shape of the answer, and so eventually we, we, we could see what the answer was. We didn't know the problem. I mean, and we were looking for the problem which had this answer. And I was talking about this, thinking about this a long time, and then Singer was visiting Oxford at the time, and I said, we started discussing, and I said to him, you know, uh, we, we, there should be something which explains this. And uh, then he, he came out one day and said, well, I think I remember what it is. It's the Dirac operator which comes from physics, and He'd done more physics than me. I had been to Dirac's lectures, but couldn't remember much. But he'd done a bit more, and differential geometry. And the two together produced the Dirac operator. Once we saw the operator, it was all done, because we had everything waiting for it. We were waiting for the emitting thing to drop in. We had all the ground prepared. We knew how it would slot in, how it was related to complex variable theory. We knew the answer. We knew lots of examples. We had everything. And well, after that, we had to have a proof. But as I said the proof is the comparatively trivial part of this operation. It took a few years to produce, and then we produced lots of different proofs. This is one proof. So the, the proof is, a, is the last stage in the operation, but the missing bit 
was to get the right point of view and to ask the right question. And so that, that was a, took a surprisingly mm -hmm. long time, well, in retrospect. So was the Dirac operator not in the air uh, before Singer brought it up with you? The Dirac operator was introduced by Dirac for physics. Yes. He explained the <coughs> quantum mechanics of the electron. And particularly that's in a Minkowski space, which is a relativistic framework. It had been generalized physicists who knew about this to, to, to curved space time, but never been used by mathematicians, to my knowledge. Oh. There were no mathematicians. Hodge, who done differential forms, harmonic forms. Dirac did uh, the Dirac operator. They were in the same department. They were colleagues for 30 years, but they didn't actually talk to each other about mathematics. If they had done, I'd have been out of a job, because my job was to fill in the what they could have done together. But they didn't. So nobody actually <coughs> had done, introduced the Dirac operator in geometry at all. Once Singer pointed it out, that you write it down, well, maybe other people thought of writing it down, but didn't do much with it. You know, what can you do with it if you don't know the motivation? Maybe, maybe some people like Tikhanovich knew about the differential geometry. They would certainly know it about it from the point of view of curved Lorentz space. But in Riemannian space, nobody ever thought, you know, what good's a harmonic spin at anybody? Uh, harmonic forms had a relation with topology, but, well, Nigel will tell you that his first thesis was really to investigate harmonic spinners and see what one could... Now, why were they, given that they didn't have any natural relationship with topology, what, what good were they? So it was, it was uh, that realization that, that uh, set things going. But um, in, in mathematicians had, so once one brought it in, of course, the mathematicians took it up. Once they'd seen what he could do with it, then it became popular, it became fashionable. And after a while, when people look back now, they say, well, it's obvious. You know, why do these guys take so long to find it? It's <laughs> <laughs> trivial. <laughs> and it is something that's trivial. You give it a graduate course, you almost the first thing you could do as an exercise, but when you're evolving this theory, it doesn't look obvious at all. You sort of, uh, it never occurred to you. So what, and the reason is fundamentally that spinners, are, I think, are still mysterious things. I don't, I, nobody, I think, understands what spinners are, I claim. Not the physicists who use them for the electron, not the algebraists who use it for representation theory, not even the geometers now start to use it. They don't really have a f good feeling for them. They don't know what they mean. They use them, and they're obviously very fundamental. But the, and there's a nice passage in one of Hermann Bauer's books when he says that only at the level of spinners do we really reach that depth of understanding of Euclidean geometry, which goes back to the Greeks. A beautiful passage, but very hard to decipher. But anyway, I, I claim we don't really understand in some strong sense of the word what, 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 what spinners are. And so it wasn't surprising in a way that it took a while for them to be introduced. What were they for? Uh, now, but they're only tool, people learning more about them, and there's ways in which you can get better understanding, but we still, it still remains a bit of a mystery. They're one of the deepest mysteries in geometry, I think. In a way, I like to put it this way. It, really, it took years, centuries, for mathematicians to understand the square root of minus one. Okay? Hundreds of years, people had, the square, they had this number, the square root of minus one, it didn't exist, but it was very useful to use it. You got marvelous theories, and you would, eventually, eventually, after 200 years of use, it became respectable, Gauss gave a definition, and modern complex variable theory was accepted, and that's fine. Now I claim that spinners is, is like the square root of geometry. Geometry involves things like lengths, areas, volumes. And spinners involve the square roots of these things. Now that's a, ve that's a much more difficult notion than the square root of minus one. And it'll take us several hundred years, I claim, to understand what the square root of the geometry really means. <laughs> I mean, you can put it philosophically, you know, you can see why it is. I like to put it that way to point out the kind of issue it is. The square root of minus one was a serious problem. It was called an imaginary number. It did not exist. It was imaginary. Yet it was damn useful. And look what you could do with it. And then, not only was it useful in algebra, it was useful in analysis and whole physics eventually. Uh, and the Dirac operator is, with, with the Gilbert and Spinners, is to do with the square, well, the Dirac operator is the square root of the Laplace operator. The Laplace operator has a long tradition in physics and history. With their square root, that operator, it took, they started off with Hamilton with his quaternions, and then with Dirac, to write down the square root of the Laplace operator. Then a good start. But the square root of an operator is not the same as the geometry. The operator is an aspect of geometry. But uh, the square root of the geometry is, 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 and we now beginning gradually with one thing or another, with twister theory and self-duality, and the, we are getting, beginning to um, piece together some sort of partial understanding of spinners in different contexts. So we, we're make, making progress, but give us another 100 years, have this round table in 100 years' time with 
some of your younger eyes might still be here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me, yeah. can you explain why the physicists talk in terms of spin up and spin down? I've found this terminology. Well, uh, Nigel might be able to do better than that. <clears throat> it, it, it's, uh, I never really understand. It, it has to do with the relationship of spin, which is, takes place in the spin of space, mm -hmm. with uh, Euclidean, the ordinary direction in space. And uh, because of the Minkowski space, the light cone it has a certain relationship with the spinners, uh, you, you can identify, and that's why spin of electron is related to angular momentum and things like that. So there is a connection between things in space that we see, up, which are up and down, and things in the spinner world, which are really in different worlds. They say they're in the square root world. But there are there is a an overlap. And so the spin up and spin down is, is part of that dictionary. But maybe Nigel can explain it better because <laughs> <laughs> I, I talk to physicists a lot and they, and they talk about it. And I, at that stage I begin to wonder, do I really understand? I understand in my own way, but when they talk in their way, it's not quite so clear to me what they really mean. I'm mm. gradually getting a bit more confident on that, but... Sometimes better not to ask what they really mean. <laughs> 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 because they think of it in a certain way, we have it our own way, yes. and we might end up being confused. <laughs> getting back to the index theorem, your, your first proof of it was uh, a cobordism yes. proof, and yet uh, the sort of definitive series of papers used K-theory. Did you always have in mind using K-theory, so was the first proof a kind of rush job in some sense? <laughs> <coughs> well, you see, the K-theory was there in Grotendieck's work, and we, de I, we developed K-theory for topological purposes as a tool. Then the index theorem for the Dirac came up to give the formula for the Dirac operator in terms of but That was for a single manifold. It wasn't general Grotendieck theory at all. But K-theory came in two places. See, <coughs> it's important to realize this. On the one hand, if you wanted to study elliptic differential operators in general, arbitrary order or whatever you like, <coughs> it was all important to understand their, local, their symbol, their local description by highest order terms. And that was, those are given by, at any given point locally, polynomial functions on the cotangent space. We took their values in the matrices. And for elliptic operators, they took their values in the non-singular matrices. So then you begin to see from there, there's a co co close relationship with the Hubbard-Toppy theory of the, of the classical groups. And K-theory comes in to understand the classification of uh, the operators on a given manifold. Uh, uh, in some topological way. And by using K-theory systematically, you can show that every operator on a manifold, of any order, whatever, in K-theory terms, can be reduced to the ones we are familiar with in differential geometry, like the Dirac operator. That's entirely separate contained to how you prove the theorem about the Dirac operator. It just reduces the general case to the particular case by using these local symbols. And that bit we knew quite early on because we knew K-theory. We knew once we'd learned about the general theory of elliptic equations, Girl fund and people, we knew that one should formally at least study them. And when we saw at once that the K, this K theory took ch charge of the symbol and it gave you a formalism, and you could formulate the results in K theory terms, that didn't give you a proof. <coughs> then you had to go back and how you give the proof. Now you had a choice. Cobordism was the most direct classical proof, analogous to what his, put in his theorem, and it gave a proof. But we knew that was not the ideal proof for lots of reasons. <coughs> First of all, it, what that didn't lend itself directly to K-theory. Secondly, it didn't, a little much further on, incorporate the Grotendieck different generalization when you're that one manifold, but you have a map between manifolds. That came much later. So we, we knew that, <coughs> but so K-theory coming in twice. It comes in once at the local level to do with the, simply the way the symbol depends on cotangent vectors. And it comes at the global level <coughs> in terms of the uh, analysis. The K and that's the way, and algebraic geometry, the confusion is that these two things fused. In algebraic geometry, the, sh the fact that sheaf theory, uh, resolutions of sheaves, gives you vector bundles, Grotendieck's technique, is a kind of fusion of the two. It takes, on the one hand, the, the local theory in it to do with the resolution of a point in vector space by a sheaf. On the other hand, it has the global theory of sheaf cohomology. So they're so closely intertwined, you can't see them separate. When you go to the real situation, they become quite clearly different. The, the, the global theory about the operators, I mean, you focus on the if you want on the Dirac operator alone, or you can look at the local theory, and then you'd have to deal with the case of the symbols. And they really, in a mysterious way, they're, they're different and complementary, yet in some ideal picture, they get unified. And eventually, they, and when you go into further reaches of the theory later on, but they, they get further unified. But it's, it's, it's slightly confusing that there are these 
two different ways in which K-theory enters. And they were both there, one of them, one of them both there from the beginning, different form. But to get the proof of the theorem, we focused on the fastest route. But we knew that that wasn't really the best route. And uh, so we were constantly looking for others to generalize it. We wanted in particular to include the fixed point formula, which had proof of bot. A fi isolated fixed point, we wanted to generalize that. And so that led to equivariant K-theory. And so the K-theory began to take, play a more important role as it went along. And we formulated it more abstractly. But it was, yeah, it was, it, the interplay between the two was an interesting, and it took a long time. Probably 10 years covered the span of the time I and other people spent on variations on the same theme and the same formulas and different proofs and different methods and so on, yeah. So uh, collaboration has been a feature of a lot of your papers. What, yes. uh, what makes a good collaborator for you, anyway? Well, a good collaborator for me is somebody whom I collaborate with. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's not so trivial. They have to have the same fundamental point of view in my side. You know, what you, what they must find interesting what you find interesting. They must have the same aesthetic values and judgment. Um, they must have the same kind of perspective, looking to the future, what they want to uncover. That's important. Without sharing a common uh, philosoph philosophy, you might put it, you're not going to get very far. They may help in the technical level. So that, that we sh I share with, I think, all the people I collaborated with. Um, secondly, it's important that each per person, party to the collaboration, brings a different, different perspective. You, you have to have the same philosophy, but a different background. You must have different expertise. You know, one, of the, one of you is good at spanners, the other is good at screwdrivers. You, know, you, you, you want to get the best of all worlds. So my collaboration with both Voss and Singer, Voss was much better. I thought he was better on topology than I was. He knew more about Lie groups. Hitzelbrook knew a lot more about Lie groups and comportism theory. Singer he knew a lot more about analysis in general. Uh, so all, uh, and then my younger collaborators like you and Graham you know, brought other uh, expertise. So uh, it's important that the, the collaborator has, has uh, something to contribute. And so when you write a paper, sometimes when you do one bit and the other partner does the rest, usually the collaboration is so intimate that, that by that stage it, you, you, you can do it either way yourself. But the, the, the technique and the sort of understanding and the background uh, is, 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 is what you're sharing, what, you, what you're exploiting. Why you can't do it on your own. You, you, uh, also, I mean, the advantage of having two people or three people collaborating is that, uh, you know, you see around the corner. You come up walking, you hit a blank wall. You, if you're coming from that side, you, you can see the other way around. When you stick a blank, hit an obstacle, a collaborator may be able to see the way around it that you don't see, and so you get on fast. It's that sort of common practice. You, you have multiple points of view. Uh, but the, the combination of a shared philosophy, and uh, also, I think it's important that you should be that should be congenial companions. You know, mathematics is a very is a very lonely game. If you play it entirely by yourself, you can do like Andrew Wiles, uh, lock yourself in your room, sit back there for seven years, and come out with a proof of the theorem, or or, or fail, as happened <laughs> with my friend Papakirikopoulos, who spent his life trying to prove the Poincaré conjecture, and you know was, was a solitary thinker and a deep thinker, but he didn't succeed. You know. So you're putting a big gamble when you're devoting your entire life all by yourself to solving something. Um, so uh, it's lonely business. And so being able to collaborate takes you out of your hermit's shell and talk with people. It keeps you, it keeps you sane, you know, which is serious. A lot of mathematicians wander over to the edges of uh, some kind of uh, insanity, uh, literally. And uh, so it, it helps to keep you in touch with the world and. and so, and that, therefore, the social aspect, it being you know, good terms and be able to share a glass of beer or a bottle of wine, uh, or go on a beach holiday together, or whatever it is, 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 is actually an important part of um, the friendship, which, which, and you become friends, of course, with your collaborators, and that's part of the nature of a good collaboration. So, it's, it's, it's a human collaboration, it's not just a sort of technical one. You, there may be somebody you consult to, how do you solve this problem? But that, that's not a co real collaboration. That's a sort of uh, contract work. How about a degree of skepticism? Is that important in a collaborator? <coughs> uh, not too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, it, it does happen. I mean, for example, Raoul Bott, uh, he, he, he loved formulae. Until he saw a formula, he didn't believe it. And I was brought up with slightly more abstract views. I said, well, look, look, Raoul, if we can prove that something is, you know, functorial, if it's if it's invariant under the uh, 
it depends only on the Riemannian metric, that, that it has to be like this. No, no, until I see the formula, you do a lot of calculations, check, yes, it works out right, you're right. Till he got the formula, he was skeptical about abstract arguments. And I used to get slightly uh, irritated at the time. Look, look around, it <laughs> must be so. But on the hand, later on, I learned that sometimes there's merit in the formula. I mean, you learn something from the formula, it's outside the box, which isn't part of what you were doing, and it goes off. And so, it, it, but that, so that helped to kept push me towards including formulae. Interesting enough, see, that's, that's a, I was, he was older than me by five years. Uh, but when I came with younger people, like my student Graham Siegel, he was the other way. He was much more abstract than me. See, so when I was <laughs> covering with him, I would try to push him towards concrete things. <laughs> and he would be, no, no, you don't need this big category theorem. Uh, you know, the same kind of tension. Well, well it is <laughs> it's an interesting uh, point of view. So, yeah, some skepticism or... Um, that isn't quite skepticism in the same sense, but I mean, a skepticism which means that you, you can't prove something because it's not true or you, you might be wrong. I haven't had much, most of my collaborators tended to be optimists. They believe that, you know, if it looks right, I'm going back to my teacher, Todd, you know, he would do lots of calculations and things and he would say, if there's any justice in this world, this must be true. <laughs> he would believe in justice in the world, a bit like Herman Bauer, huh? uh, you couldn't have this beautiful formula if it wasn't true. And that, that was his sort of, so I inherited a bit of that. If I find a beautiful formula, it, you know, it had to be true. And the, most of my collaborators tended to go along with that. Although I, I, I do remember one occasion when, with this uh, Graham, where he was the other way around, he said something can't be, I suggested something. He said, no, it can't possibly work. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't work at all. So I got put off. And I came back to it later, later on, and it did work. So then I explained it to him. I told you that all along. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm a Freud. <laughs> you could convert from being skeptical to being enthusiast overnight sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, it's, I don't think I, I don't. Well, there are skeptics outside from people I didn't work with who say, oh, you caught this is, you know, uh, won't work. It's so much too airy fairy. But among my collaborators, we tended to be optimists. Mm -hmm. so, See, I read a quotation the other day from James Joyce that errors are the portal of discovery. Mm. Now, did that ever feature in your work? Um, well, I always just tell my students, people, you know, mm. you, you learn by your mistakes. If you, <laughs> I mean, you mustn't take it too seriously. You mustn't make mistakes deliberately in order to you know, make progress. But you learn, because if you make a mistake and you can't find out where the mistake is, you sweat like anything trying to understand why it went wrong. That understanding is then something you learn, you gain, you see something which before you glide, glided over. And so, yes, you do learn from your errors. I've made, uh, I'm trying to think, of, I mean, these are sort of, um, so that an error is a misconception. Yeah. You know, it's a sort of failing to understand something which you should have done and then when you've learned that. I'm sure there are, and you do, I mean, sometimes you're doing that all the time, lower le technical level or a more difficult level. You, you, you do things <coughs> and then something doesn't work and you go back and look at it carefully. And at the simplest level, you go back and find there's some very subtle question about signs, you know, which is always bedevils those people. And then you get into it, you find that actually those signs are really quite delicate and require careful attention and, and a few places like that. So, yes, you learn from your, your, your errors. I mean, that's, that's, and if you didn't make any errors, I think you, well, you've been human, first of all, you must make errors. You're R.E.S. to Mani, I think is the Latin phrase Asian. And so, uh, and you learn from the mistakes because if you, you if you learn something too easily, you also, you, you, you know, you open a book and read it. And they don't find it difficult. You forget it overnight. If you had a struggle, couldn't follow it, you know, then it sticks. So um, if you don't see the difficulties, or you don't notice any difficulties, then, then you, you, you won't remember. Or, and you don't, if you had to struggle through, the, then you really know every step of the way, and every yard you, you, is built into you. Yeah, so I, I totally agree with you. Now. He wasn't a mathematician. <laughs> this, this is a general statement it's outside yeah. mathematics, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe we can move on to more general issues. I mean, as uh, president of the Royal Society, you had a, an overview of all scientific subjects and, uh, and the people that practice them. Uh, do you think mathematicians are different from the rest? Um, yeah, well, I mean, every, every, every mathematician is different. Every other mathematician, every scientist is different in all sorts of ways. So the, the, and, but mathematics is, is, of course, different from other sciences. In fact, in some places, it isn't counted. Edinburgh University, where my wife went to mathematics, you could do mathematics either as part of the arts degree or as part of the science degree, and you chose. 
Um, so, it, and it's true that mathematics is both an art and a science, and sometimes people doubt whether it's a science. And my view was always that you know, science essentially uses mathematics, and ma mathematics without science is difficult to really justify <coughs> or identify. So I think it's, it, 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 um, but nevertheless, it's different. You don't have to do experiments. If you're every physicist, chemist, biologist spends 90% of his time or the field as a whole on doing experiments, and 10% of their time thinking about them or, or theorizing about them. Mathematicians are the other way around. You do 90% of the time thinking and perhaps 10% of your time doing a calculation or putting on the computer or something like that, or talking to a, somebody who does experiment. So the, the, the balance between experiment and theory is very, very different. Mathematics is inherently the ultimate theoretical subject. And, and so with physics, theoretical physics, the difference is not that enormous. If you're doing high-energy theoretical physics, every experiment costs you $100 billion. So you know, there aren't any experiments. You have to wait for 10 years until they build the next accelerator. Meanwhile, you've got, got no choice but to do, do theory. So high-energy physicists are very almost indistinguishable from mathematicians in that sense. But to go down to the solid-state physicists, they're the electricians, and the different world, the chemists, and the biologists even more. They have not much, very little theory to go on. Well, now they're getting a bit more. So the, the mathematics is at the one end of the spectrum. The only people who are further out on that spectrum are the logicians. Uh, and they, of course, by the back door have become computer scientists. And it's an interesting inversion. I mean, the, a lot of the time, if you trained a PhD in logic, he was the one guy who couldn't get a job because he was so abstract. Now they're, they're the guys who have bought up by the computer companies. So the logic became part of computer science and came, became, therefore, integrated back into science. But it was a time when you, know, you went from mathematics to logic, from logic to philosophy, uh, like Bertrand Russell, people like that, uh, or then and from philosophy you went into theology. You know, those, that was the <laughs> hierarchy. In, in the old days, theology was actually the pinnacle. That was the ultimate uh, thought, thoughts were in philosophy. And of course, science was called philosophy, was also called philosophy, it was called natural philosophy as opposed to moral philosophy. Um, so, uh, and so the time I still philosophize, and uh, there is still something called philosophy, mathematics, philosophy of science. Um, but, math but mathematics, is, is, yes, I was president of the Royal Society. I was, I was aware that I came from a rather small niche. In fact, when they asked me to be president, I said, Well, I'm not really a scientist. No, I'm, an, I'm only a mathematician. And even, and even a pure, if there are some applied mathematicians, I said, Well, I understand that a pure mathematician. I thought, and so I was very hesitant. I didn't say yes immediately. I said, I need a bit to think about it. Um, because you know, you're so, on, so far on the one wing that it's difficult for you to, to speak on behalf of the whole community, take a central point of view. But eventually I, I agreed and did my best. And of course, you go back in time. Newton was president of the Royal Society. And in those days, you, know, you, you could be a mathematician and a physicist and a scientist and everything. Was there anybody between you and Newton? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the, as president of the Royal Society, I mean. yes. yes, there were one or two. Um, <laughs> A uh, hundred years before me, there was, a, there was a, somebody who was a mathematician and president of the Royal Society, who was not very famous, but the name escapes me now. But I, uh, and then, uh, um, then there were, of course, people who were applied mathematicians. Not sure, as, well, Kelvin was certainly, well, Kelvin was a physicist, but he was, he was president of the Royal Society. Um, Stokes was an applied mathematician. Uh, so people of that ilk. Uh, 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 were were present also in between, um, but the last one before was certainly hundred years before, and uh, mm -hmm. so they hadn't had any mathematicians, even applied mathematicians. Well, they had they had, they had physicists, I mean, honest to goodness, physicists. But they were, well, Clark Maxwell wasn't president of the Royal Society, was he? Uh, but they, you know, Rutherford, J. T. Th 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 um, uh, Thompson, and uh, Kelvin, and, and uh, Lord Rayleigh, they were all president of the Royal Society. Do you think pure mathematics has a, a healthy future when funding bodies want uh, more direct applications? Uh, well, I, I mean, I only follow these things nowadays somewhat at a distance. Um, I think uh, it, 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 these things are phases. They, sure, they go in and out, and some administrator makes a decision, and, somebody, and then it reacts badly. I mean, I think we've been through good phases and bad phases in the past. And in the old days, I was reminded that mathematics wasn't regarded as a subject that you put a lot of money in for commercial benefit, it wasn't, it wasn't justified on those basis. Then, of course, the numbers have grown much more, 
So now people say, well, what do you get for your buck? And so they ask some questions. And so at the beginning, the, bit, the more expensive you are, the more people ask questions. So it's, it's, it's partly a consequence of success, you might say, because mathematics is now more widely studied, more mathematicians around, more help is given by universities. So then people ask questions, and you go through a phase where they'll, they'll, they'll turn against you. But I think those are the ups and downs. My main point when I was president of the Royal Society was try to persuade the mathematical community that their best help came from keeping closely to their scientific colleagues in adjacent fields, engineers, physicists, astronomers, chemists, because these guys know the value of mathematics. They, they, they sufficiently mathematics sophisticated. They know that without mathematics, their subject couldn't develop. And so they, in the broad sense, are, and they are, of course, a large community, and they carry a lot of clout. So if, you have the, if you're on the same, they have it on your side, you can argue a case for mathematics to government for this. If you go out on your own and say, well, you guys are doing inferior stuff, we do pure mathematics, and you know, we're superior to you, you lose, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> because you carry no weight. The weight is carried by the people who are linked into the world outside, also the physicists are, engineers are. So I think mathematicians have best bet always say in good terms and working relationship with colleagues in, in, in neighboring, in, in broad scientific, then, then they stand a chance. And the scientific community as a whole will back them. I mean, the scientists outside, yes, you say you must support mathematics. You know, we, we need mathematically trained people. We need, we need advanced mathematics. <coughs> there, some of them, you may get varying degrees of support. But basically, they are on your side. And without them, you're set. You really are losing wicked. I can use an American, British expression. <laughs> uh, getting back to the mathematics, what, uh, what do you think are the main challenges in geometry today? I mean, I mean they, they differ from those in the 1950s uh, when, when you were beginning, perhaps? I mean, perhaps or perhaps not? Well, you know, uh, I mean, um, when I was beginning, uh, I was at a cusp point of the past. It was after the war. The war intervened. Before the war, there was this, well, when I regarded a great period, Hodge theory was a big thing in, in that tradition. Um, after the war, there was this fantastic development in algebraic topology and in uh, sheaf cohomology. People like Serre and Cartan, people in Prince of Kadira. That was a tremendous, and uh, Grotendieck. It was a tremendous, exciting period, which launched off new directions. And I was fortunate to be around to catch the sort of drift of that. Um, we didn't think in terms of challenges. I mean, there were challenges. I mean, how, the people would say, well, you have to <coughs> provide foundations for what all the Italian algebraic geometers did. But that's a sort of dull way of looking at it. I mean, the Italians did good stuff. They didn't have the right tools, and the right tools come along. But modern theory did much more than provide the tool. It provided the whole framework and stru structure, which was way beyond technical tools. So it enlarged the scope. Um, and it combined, brought in Lie groups as well. And so so it, was, it was unified large parts of mathematics. And uh, it was very healthy. And then that set the tone. That set the, the, the problems came out. It, you know, people. Nobody before had thought about studying differentiable structures of manifolds. It was regarded as topology until Milner came along with his exotic spheres, and, and then that subsequent Donaldson could even bigger. So we, these problems weren't predicted. Nobody could predict. Nobody thought. Well, they, they, they realized that you, know, you had to prove something, but they thought the proof would be obvious. You know, you prove the obvious. The Poincaré well, eventually it was proved. But, uh, so <coughs> I think the challenge is, is, is usually the most exciting thing that I claim always the unexpected. If you know that there's a problem there to be solved, you know what it is, well, you, know, you, you, you tackle it. It may take a long time, like 300 years with the Fermat's theorem, and you build up big machinery. But most of the time, it isn't like that. You know, the, the un unexpected things are discovered en route. <coughs> well, some, certainly, uh, the thing that's most surprising, Donaldson theory was totally unexpected. It opened up totally a new door. And the relationship with physics, which was intimately related with that, were really totally unexpected. So all the new things coming out of the interplay between geometry and physics are new. But Put them as challenges, I think, is, is underestimating them. You know, we have to understand what this all means. That's more than a challenge. That's a sort of a philosophical uh, conversion. And, and and that'll keep us busy for 100 years, I think. Uh, understanding what it means, do, what do you do with it, how do you develop the theory, how much of it is physics, how much is mathematics. We're in the middle of it now. We're probably one quarter along a century's worth. And so you can see that it's, uh, there are, of course, technical challenges. You know, Proving this theorem, that theorem, which are good uh, local objectives and sometimes focus attention. 
and those can drive a subject. Fermat's last theorem led number theorists to develop algebraic number theory for hundreds of years and led to all sorts of things, including finally the proof. But even if it hadn't led to the proof, it would still have been success successful exercise in stimulating ideas. Uh, and, well, I suppose the Poincare conjecture, in some sense, has had a somewhat, or certainly three manifold theory, but <coughs> four manifolds is still an open. I mean, if you want to know what the biggest challenge is, understand four manifolds. We don't. So there were various times along the way where people thought, ah, yes, Donaldson theory shows it wasn't what you thought it was. It's really algebraic geometry in disguise. Then they said, no, that's no, not that. Now it's symplectic geometry. And the goalposts keep moving. And not even Donaldson has given up. There's no, nobody has a sensible conjecture about what's wrong now. Unknown story. How many new kinds of analysis will we find? How many new invariants will they produce? I think that's. Uh, the people who know most about it are the least dogmatic about what to expect. Only guys who are, you know, don't know much say, well, here is a nice conjecture which we'll finish it off and prove it. There's no, there's no good conjecture, really. I mean, the four-dimensional four Poincaré conjecture, that's a smooth manifold, is a little small subset of it, but that won't get you very far. So I think the, the, there are particular problems within it. I don't think they highlight that this 11 eighth conjecture or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So there are technical issues in the beginning, but they just show our ignorance. And I think so understanding four manifolds in some deep sense, understanding spinners in deep sense, which may go along with that, understanding the relationship of geometry and physics in a deep sense. What has all this got to do with real physics? Is all this string theory really physics, or is it mathematics? You know, there are people out in the physical, the physics world who say, this is not physics, it's mathematics. If you want a job, go to the mathematics department. That's a big problem for young theory, string theorists. Um, and I sympathize with the physicists because string theory stuff is so far removed, yet any present day, any experimental test is impossible because the orders of magnitude are so small or large. Uh, nevertheless, I think theory still has a lot of physical basis to it, has a lot of interesting connection with cosmology, I think. But where is it going to go? What, what, in other words, whether string theory will be a important part of theory that evolves physics and eccentricity or not remains to be seen. And is it going to be a dominant part or a minor player? Will there be some totally new ideas coming along where string theory is sidelined? All these are big questions which we don't, I think, know. Again, the people who know most about this, like Witten, and people who are least convinced are those guys, whom David Gross is one, for example, think you know, they nearly solved the problem. We have a theory, it's called string theory, and we're just almost there, around the corner, you know, let's wait a year or two. And I think people like Witten realize that's not true. Um, they're close to solving some problems, but I think they're, 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 they're realizing a long way to go. So I think it's a long way to go. So that's what, so what is physics, where physics will go is a big problem. And what, but I have the mathematics that comes from physics, which is, string, which is absorbed in that is definitely mathematics. And there's a big mathematical future, even if physicists decide they need something else. That's happened in the past. Physics, physicists produce a theory, mathematicians uh, used it, physicists then forgot about it, did something better, the mathematicians went on. Not theory is a good example. So um, I think that's, that'll keep mathematics busy for 100 years, trying to understand the, the mathematics that goes behind that. And I say, I, I like to describe that as understanding Physicists are doing something like symmetry, nonlinear Fourier transform theory, uh, special geometries. Uh, these are all generalizations of previous geometry and infinite dimensional moduli spaces, function spaces. In the old days, it's called calculus of variations. You can see old threads in that. I suspect that will go into the big area for that. and subsidiaries will follow out. A little bit of number theory here, a bit of algebra there. Sorry about that. Um, so the I see a very exciting future. I think mathematics is, is, a, is a good place to be at the moment. It's not something we'll think at you know, any given stage we're nearly finished. Close the so door, close the books, pack up, take something else. I think that's so wrong. You've, you've, you've been a geometer, and that's yeah. been closely tied to physics, mechanics, the real, yeah. the real world. Now biology <coughs> is in the upswing. Mm -hmm. and it's not clear to me what sort of mathematics is going to come out of that. Do you, <coughs> have, do you have some views? Well, I mean, I think one has to express a certain festival of caution. Uh, the fact that mathematics has been so successful in physics and by corollary in chemistry and related things and astronomy uh, doesn't guarantee that it's going to be equally successful in biology. There are people who say that biology is a totally different field. God may have written down the fundamental equations of physics, 
but with biology, you just lay down the rules and threw the dice and let that evolution take its course. And you, you know, we, we are here by a series of mistakes and, well, natural selection, which is not a mathematical a form process. Natural selection is mathematical in some sense, but the outcome isn't get, doesn't lead itself to many laws. Well, that that's and that, if that's true to some extent. The question is to what extent? Uh, there are there are undoubtedly certain fundamental facts of biology which are laws. Uh, genetic code is a, is a very mathematical structure in a way. Uh, DNA, it's how the genetics, how things are constrained, is and then. Uh, so that's very definitely as mathematics. And the, the big question, I think, uh, is will mathematics play a significant role at, at some high, really high, higher level? Well, the one place it might play a big role is in understanding how the brain works. Now, the big question for the 21st or 22nd century of biology is how does the brain really work? And the, we're just scratching the surface. People know a lot more than they did 25 years ago, but it's just a tiny bit. They really have very little idea of and they, when they maybe make, make analogy with computers, they're t totally naive. So the brain is actually a much more sophisticated thing that most people working in the field would like you to believe or pretend. Uh, the, the computer scientists think it's just a computer. The, the real good people who work in neurology know that it's, they're nowhere near really. A, they know made a lot of progress, but in the light of what well, it looked like 100 years later, looking back, that you'll, you know, you'll be calling them just done baby food physics by men. So I think, and that might require a very much more sophisticated set of ideas which might be mathematical. And the mathematics might not yet have been involved properly. But um, one of my, I work with a colleague who's a neurophysiologist and his, his view about the brain is that it, 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 it has a hierarchical structure. It builds on levels of abstraction on itself, just like mathematics. Mathematics is the ultimate hierarchical subject, which is why you can't drop out and come in again. Every level is built on abstraction. I don't like it. You know, I don't like category theory, but you know, and, and, and multiple categories. But it, it is built on levels of abstraction. And my friend said that the brain really works in a similar way. Therefore, there could well be a interplay between the levels of the abstraction hierarchies in mathematics and in the brain. There are some way which they can be useful um, templates for thinking. Um, for example, in the brain, you know, we, we, well, the philosophers always like to say, you know, what is a chair? A chair, well, there are millions of different kinds of chairs. The fact that the brain recognizes a chair as an object is a miracle, you know, because, well, let's look at dogs. <laughs> so many different kinds of dogs, yet we see a dog. So we've made, but the brain has abstracted out the notions that correspond to the objects we see, even though the variety you see is incredibly detailed and different. And they had to do that. They couldn't, we couldn't have survived the evolutionary terms. If we didn't know, you know a lion was a lion, even if it didn't look quite like the other lion. So you had to be able to, so the brain has had to evolve levels of abstraction. That's the kind of first level, getting to the chair level. Uh, and to progress, and our success in evolution has depended on our developing a brain that is better and better at abstraction. And so in that very general sense, you might think mathematics might have a contribution to make. It's a mistake to think that mathematicians can go in and say, well, I've got a drawing board for what the brain looks like, and here it is, you know. This is the theory of the brain. Forget it. You've got to start with the experimental data. You've got to look at what many people know, and you've got to work with all the neurophysiologists. You've got to uh, breed a, into a group of people who can talk to each other, like with physicists and mathematicians, and eventually, and there are, this is happening a bit, but it may be a long way to go. So we may be talking about what will happen in 100 years' time. And if that happens, then we will say, ah, yes, there is really a mathematical theory which helps to understand how we think. And then they'll say that's a big mathematical contribution. And all the other stuff will be piddling, you know, nuts and bolts. At the moment, we're still in the nuts and bolts here. Mm -hmm. Although molecular biology has moved a bit beyond that. We're a bit higher up. But, I mean, you ask me how I use my biology, I think an outsider. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ask a real biologist. Perhaps with those 100-year perspectives, it might be a good, I good idea to, to wrap up. Yeah. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Oh, Michael, thank, thank you. Thank you. We look forward to meeting you in 100 years' time. <laughs> 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 in this year, world or the next. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.